when young gay men began turning up dead of a fatal drug overdose in Barking East London, authorities initially shrugged it off as a coincidence. Eventually, it became obvious that someone out there was intentionally killing these men and he wasn't going to stop. This is Monsters. Stephen John Port was born on February 22, 1975. When he was still a toddler, his family relocated from Essex to Dagenham, East London, where they lived for the rest of Stephen's childhood and adult life. From a very early age, other kids picked up on the fact that something wasn't quite right with Stephen, and he became a regular target for bullies. His classmates and teachers both described him as a quiet boy who kept to himself, and even during his teenage years, he remained a loner. At 16 years old, Stephen left school and decided that he wanted to go to art college. However, his parents were unable to afford the college fees. So, Stephen had to pick a backup option, and shortly after, he began the grueling process of training to be a chef while continuing to live at home with his parents. In his 20s, Stephen publicly came out as a gay man. He struggled in his romantic relationships. At least one of his partners decided to break up with him, claiming that his behavior was too immature and childish. Other people in Stephen's life also noticed his childishness. One of his neighbors later reported that, despite being an adult man, Stephen appeared to have the habits and personality of a young boy, including spending time playing with kids' toys. After more than a decade living at home as an adult, Stephen moved into a flat of his own when he was in his 30s after getting a job as a chef at a bus depot. The culinary industry was notoriously hard to break into, but after years of hard work, he had a steady job, even appearing in the background of an episode of the TV series MasterChef. Stephen didn't just work hard at his career, he was also determined to improve himself as much as possible. After being bullied throughout his childhood, he was now an athletic-looking man who spent a lot of time at the gym. By his early 30s, he had gone bald, which made him incredibly insecure. But he hid his baldness from others by wearing an expensive, professional hairpiece which boosted his confidence in public. However, Stephen didn't tend to meet his dates by approaching them at bars or cafes. No, instead he was a frequent user of online dating sites and hookup apps, as well as LGBT social networking sites. When he was creating his profiles on the sites, he got into the habit of lying about his own life. In one of his profiles, he claimed that he worked as a teacher for kids with special needs. In another, he had claimed that he had been in the Navy and had gotten a degree from Oxford University. On June 17, 2014, Stephen messaged a fashion student named Anthony Walgate. Anthony occasionally engaged in sex work and provided escort services, and when Stephen reached out to him, he pretended that he was interested in hiring an escort, claiming that he was willing to pay the 800-pound fee. Anthony believed that Stephen legitimately wanted to hire him and accepted an invitation to meet Stephen at Barking Station in London. The station was close to Stephen's flat, and when he invited Anthony to come home with him, Anthony agreed. Shortly afterwards, Stephen poured Anthony a drink, and within half an hour, Anthony was totally incapacitated. Stephen had spiked the drink with gamma-hydroxybutyric acid, a date-rape drug commonly known as GHB, or liquid ecstasy. GHB works as a powerful sedative. In small doses, it causes lower inhibitions and euphoria, but in higher doses, it can lead to blackouts, loss of consciousness, and death. The first dose that Anthony ingested wasn't fatal, and while he was unable to consent, Stephen sexually assaulted the man. Then he gave Anthony a second dose of GHB, and this time, it was fatal. The following morning, Stephen dragged Anthony's body out of his flat and left it on the sidewalk there. He placed a bottle of GHB into Anthony's pocket, hoping that it would give the appearance that Anthony had accidentally overdosed. 
Using his own phone, he dialed 999 and asked for an ambulance, telling the operator that he had been driving by in his car when he had seen a young boy who he believed collapsed or had a seizure or was drunk. Stephen never gave any of his details to the operator, and once he was told that an ambulance was on the way, he calmly returned to his flat. An ambulance rushed to the address, but the paramedics were unable to save Anthony, who had been dead for hours. That highlighted a hole in Stephen's story. When he was talking to the operator, he had claimed that he had found Anthony while he was still alive and making gurgling noises. If any officers had been able to look further into Stephen's legal history, they would have discovered that he had faced date rape allegations in 2012, and that he had been questioned in connection to another drugging only a few weeks before Anthony died. However, neither of those instances had been logged on the police's crime reporting information system, so none of the officers on the case were aware that it wasn't the first time Stephen had been connected to a drugging case. Stephen's first victim was an unnamed 19-year-old man known as Victim A, a university student who had messaged him on Grindr in 2012. Victim A had agreed to go over to Stephen's flat and was immediately put at ease, noticing that Stephen seemed calm and friendly. When Stephen poured him a glass of wine, Victim A drank it, but when the glass was nearly empty, he noticed that there was a layer of powder at the bottom of the glass, and he believed that his drink had been spiked. His suspicions were confirmed when he started to have difficulty thinking straight and then became clumsy and dizzy. After a while, victim A lost consciousness and Stephen took him to his bedroom, undressed him, and sexually assaulted him. When the effects of the drug wore off, victim A left Stephen's flat and went back to the university, where he told one of his friends about his ordeal and then visited a doctor, saying that he believed his drink had been spiked. Stephen's second victim, Victim B, had met him through a different gay dating site. Just like Victim A, he found that he felt comfortable around Stephen, who he initially thought was a very nice guy. Stephen offered him a glass of a non-alcoholic drink, and almost immediately after drinking it, Victim B lost consciousness. When he woke up, he found that he was totally out of control of his body, crying out for help and shouting as loud as he could. While Victim B was still under the influence, Stephen took him to nearby Barking train station telling the transport police officers that Victim B had taken GHB. By that point, Victim B was vomiting and struggling to stand upright. Stephen was questioned by officers, but he was never charged. Two weeks later, Anthony Walgate was killed. The coroner noticed that Anthony had a large amount of bruising beneath his arms, suggesting that he had been moved after his death. His fly was also undone, and his underwear were both backwards and inside out, indicating that they may have been taken off before being hastily put back on. Despite those findings, Anthony's death was never ruled as being suspicious. One week after Anthony's body was discovered, the investigation revealed that Stephen knew more than he was letting on. Using a pseudonym, he had used Anthony's escort services. When Stephen was confronted with the truth, he told a different story. He admitted that he had hired Anthony, but shortly afterwards, Anthony had decided to take GHB. He'd accidentally taken a fatal dose and had passed away in Stephen's flat, causing him to panic and call an ambulance. On June 27, 2014, the homicide investigation team recommended that the barking police should confiscate Stephen's laptop. However, it took another 10 months for the police to submit the device for examination and more than a year for the results of the examination to be looked over. The employee who examined the results was a trainee and he managed to overlook that Stephen had spent hours and hours viewing date rape gay pornography and that he had spent a significant amount of time in online forums talking about sexually assaulting unconscious men. Allegedly, several of Stephen's friends had pressed the police to check his laptop, insisting that their friend was quote-unquote dodgy as fuck. Even then, they were told that the process of examining the laptop was too expensive. Stephen was charged with concealing key information from the police, and after he pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice, he received an eight-month jail sentence in March of 2015. But by then, two more men were already dead, and the prosecutor who recommended the sentence was never told about the previous allegations against Stephen. The contents of Stephen's laptop, which had been seized for examination and contained key information about the case, had not yet been processed. 
Following Anthony's killing, Stephen was free to commit several more murders using a similar M.O. every time. He trawled a large number of dating sites and hookup apps, including Grinder, Daddy Hunt, Couchsurfing, Manhunt, and Fit Lads. The majority of the men that Stephen talked to on those apps escaped with their lives. In fact, one of his neighbors, Ryan Edwards, described Stephen as having a, quote, revolving door of boys coming and going. Not only that, but Ryan was concerned about Stephen's romantic life because from what he could see, Stephen seemed to be attracted to vulnerable men who were very young. So young that Ryan began to wonder if his neighbor was actually a pedophile. Ryan was also worried about Stephen's drug use, but when he voiced his concerns, Stephen was able to reassure him that he was okay. In August of 2014, Stephen killed his ex-roommate, 22-year-old Slovakian immigrant Gabriel Kavari, and then disposed of his body in the graveyard of a nearby church. Gabriel's body was found by a local woman taking her dog on a morning walk. Then, Stephen murdered a fellow chef, 21-year-old Daniel Whitworth, and disposed of his body in the exact same location. Incredibly, Daniel's body was also discovered by the same woman while she was out on a different walk with her dog. I want to point out that not only did Stephen ruin the lives of his victims and their families, but he also ruined that poor woman's life. Imagine the horror of finding a dead body while walking your dog, then the horror of finding another dead body while walking your dog, and how nervous you would be every time you go to take your dog for a walk. There are always victims who are unrelated to the people who are murdered who tend to go unnoticed. To try to avoid the police becoming suspicious about the similarities between Gabriel and Daniel's deaths, Stephen wrote a fake suicide note which he left with Daniel's body. The note, claiming to be written by Daniel, stated that he was the man who had killed Gabriel and that he had decided to commit suicide in the same location because of his overwhelming guilt. The note claimed that Daniel's death had been an accident because Gabriel had mistakenly given him a lethal dose of GHB during a sexual encounter. The police also failed to follow up on the anonymous guy that was mentioned in the note, which read, quote, BTW, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. We only had sex, then I left. He knows nothing of what I've done. The guy was, in fact, the note's real author, Stephen Port. Seriously, how obvious is that? Even though there was no evidence that Gabriel and Daniel had ever been connected, and no evidence that Daniel had even been embarking when Gabriel had died, the Metropolitan Police took the suicide note at face value. They didn't carry out any forensic testing on the bedsheet that Daniel's body had been wrapped in, the GHB bottle that Stephen had planted at the scene, or even the note itself. To verify that Daniel was the note's author, the police didn't consult a handwriting expert. Instead, they scanned a partial sentence to send to Daniel's father for confirmation, and compared the text in the rest of the note to Daniel's diary. Because the segment of text that Daniel's father received was so small, he was unable to confirm whether he recognized his son's handwriting or not. Stephen's crimes were interrupted by his jail sentence for lying about Anthony's death, but after a short amount of time behind bars, he was released early. Almost immediately, he went back to his old ways, going back on his dating apps on the hunt for his next victim. Stephen began talking to 25-year-old Jack Taylor, a forklift driver who still lived with his parents. Jack had used gay dating sites before, but he hadn't come out as gay to most of the people in his life. He wanted to keep things discreet. Stephen wanted to meet at Barking Train Station, and Jack traveled from his home in Dagenham to meet him there at just past 3 a.m. on September 13, 2015. Four and a half hours later, Stephen blocked Jack's Grinder account, effectively deleting the evidence that the two of them had ever communicated. Then he deleted his own account and sent his flatmate several messages asking him to not come back to the flat that morning. It's believed that he was trying to stall for time, waiting until he had the opportunity to remove Jack's body from the flat. He held onto the body for the rest of the day and then transported it to the graveyard that night. Believing that he needed to stop dumping bodies in the exact same location, Stephen changed up his method by disposing of Jack's body in a small park next to the graveyard instead, with only a wall separating it from the place where Gabriel and Daniel's bodies had been left. He left a small GHB bottle, some alcohol wipes, and a tourniquet in Jack's pocket, 
once again trying to give the impression that the death had been an accidental overdose. It took four bodies for the Metropolitan Police to begin regarding the deaths as suspicious, but that still didn't happen immediately. Police Constable John Taylor was the first officer to arrive at the crime scene and he was tasked with questioning the victim's family. But Jack's family refused to accept that their son had died because of drugs. In fact, they repeatedly told the police that Jack had been extremely against drugs and would never have taken them recreationally. They also had no idea why Jack had been embarking in the first place. Almost two weeks after Jack's death, two of his sisters contacted the police department requesting an update on the case, but they were told that there was no progress in the investigation. His family were frustrated. It seemed as if the investigators had seen the needle marks in Jack's arm and the drug paraphernalia in his pockets and had decided for themselves that the death was not suspicious. Jack's sisters decided to carry out their own research and found something strange. Three other young gay men in the area who had recently been found dead after an overdose. When they took that information to the police, they were allegedly told that it was simply a coincidence. Constable Taylor was a parks officer and he had never worked as an investigator before, but he had a feeling that something about Jack's death wasn't right. Over the next few days, he began reaching out to the last people to see Jack alive, trying to retrace the victim's footsteps before his death. After discovering that Jack had recently been to Barking Train Station, the police examined the CCTV footage, which showed that Jack had met up with an unidentified man. A detective who had worked on the Anthony Walgate case looked at the footage and instantly recognized the tall man that Jack had met shortly before his death. The last person to see Jack Taylor alive was Stephen Port. Stephen was quickly arrested and charged with poisoning and murdering all four of his victims. The following year, additional counts were added for sexual assault, poisoning, and rape. It didn't matter how many charges were stacked against him, Stephen stuck to his story, denying any of the charges were truthful and claiming that he was innocent of all the crimes he was accused of. Hey, Stephen, did you, did you write this letter? Yeah, CLT 11. No, I didn't. Photos of it is found with Daniel. Are you telling us the truth, Stephen? I'm telling you the truth, yes. About the letter? Yes. I know since you. About all of these boys? Yeah. Young boys. In the early stages of their youth, really, in terms of in their early 20s. All found dead. Stephen? I understand, but... Close to your house. One of them had been in your house. Either just before the time when he died and was found to have large quantities of a drug in his system. The other three were all found just over the road in the churchyard. Or just beside the churchyard in that area that we've discussed. Yep. Propped up against the wall. Short distance from your house. All again with high levels of GHB in them, enough to kill them. Highly unusual way to die for one person. This is four, all found very close to where you live. All men, young men, type of men that you say you find attractive. All now dead, Stephen. <clears throat> I said, I'm mentally, I know nothing about never free how they come to be. At Stephen's trial, the true horror of his crimes came out. He hadn't just assaulted and murdered Anthony, Gabriel, Daniel, and Jack. He had also drugged and raped several other men who had lived to tell the tale. In total, Stephen had 11 known victims, but because he was targeting gay men, many of whom might have been closeted or afraid to come forward, it's likely that there were many more. 
Almost all of Stevens' victims were men that he had met on Grindr or other gay dating sites. Some of them only met up with him once, but he had a casual long-term sexual relationship with at least one of the men. All of the victims reported that Stephen had administered a large dose of a date rape drug to them. On several occasions, he had told them that he was applying lubricant when he was actually administering a large dose of GHB. Even though several of the victims had initially consented to sexual intercourse with Stephen, they had never consented to taking the drugs or having sexual acts performed while they were unconscious. Several of the victims were plagued with a sense of guilt after Stephen's arrest. They felt as if they might have prevented his crimes if they had gone to the police after the assault. The deputy chief crown prosecutor on the case, Malcolm McAfee, said that Stevens' chilling and calculating use of the date rape drug had allowed him to manipulate and control his victims. On November 23, 2016, Stephen was found guilty of the murder, assault, and rape charges against him, as well as 10 counts of administering a substance with intent. Two days later, he was handed his sentence, life behind bars with a whole life order. In England, a whole life order means that a prisoner must serve out the rest of their natural life in prison without the possibility of conditional release or parole. The aftermath of Stephen's crimes continued to make headlines long after he was sentenced to life in prison. When Stephen was planning his murders, he had bought the GHB from a drug dealer by the name of Gerald Matovu. In 2019, Gerald was also arrested for murder. As if he'd copied Stephen's crimes, he met a man named Eric Michaels on Grinder, and when the two met up, Gerald drugged him with a lethal dose of GHB. Afterward, Gerald was convicted of Eric's murder, and just like Stephen, he was given a life sentence. In 2020, a man named Rafael appeared on a Brazilian talk show and told the story of his past relationship with Stephen Port which had taken place in 2012. On the show, Raphael shared that he had moved to London at the age of 19 and had met Stephen on a dating site. Shortly afterwards, the two started a relationship and Stephen invited Raphael to move in with him, but they broke up only a month later. Following the breakup, Raphael quit his job as a waiter and moved back to his home country of Brazil. Years later, once Stephen was already in jail, Raphael had a sudden urge to Google his ex-boyfriend's name. Looking through the results, he first thought that Stephen had been involved in making a documentary on a serial killer, but after reading for a few minutes, he realized that Stephen was a serial killer. Two years after the breakup, Stephen had killed Anthony Walgate, and all of the victims were of a similar age to Raphael at the time he dated Stephen. Raphael said, quote, Looking back, there were a lot of strange things going on. Immediately after Stephen was convicted, an independent police complaints commission investigation was opened into the actions of 17 police officers who had been involved in investigating the murders. Detective Inspector Kirk, who had been the head of Barking Police at the time Stephen's crime took place, defended the actions of his officers. He stated, quote, I'm not going to excuse what happened, but these were not officers who were lazy. They were working relentlessly in difficult conditions with very little reward or recognition. Because that's why you become a police officer, for the recognition. The families of the victims also opened a civil claim against the police, alleging that the killings could have been prevented if the investigation into Stephen's earlier crimes had been more thorough. The family's lawyer stated that the families believed that the police had been negligent due to homophobia, and the inquest jury found that the police had shown, quote, a large number of very serious and very basic investigative failings. At a 2021 inquest, the jury found that these failings, quote, probably contributed to the death of Gabriel, Daniel, and Jack. In 2023, a report by His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services was released, suggesting that the issues that had led to Stephen Port's crimes being overlooked were still at large in the Metropolitan Police. His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, Matt Parr, believed that it was possible for the crimes of another serial killer to be missed by investigators because of a lack of processes to identifying links between seemingly unrelated deaths. He said, quote, The most challenging question for us to answer is whether events like these could happen again. History and the findings of this inspection tell us that they will. What leads a person to turn on his fellow human and take their life? 
Did a lifetime of insecurity turn Stephen Port into the horrible monster he became, or was he born that way? It's something we'll likely never know, but at least he's behind bars for the rest of his life. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.